سلام به همگی دوستان به برنامه نانگالستان خوش اومدید من مریم نمازی هم و من فریبورز پویا هستم در برنامه این هفته در رابطه با جایزه ای که به بهروز بوچانی اهدا شد بالاترین جایزه ادبی استرالیا و ایشون یک کسی که الان 6 سال در جزیره منوس در بدترین بدترین شرایط کتابی نوشته و واقعا سخن سخنانش انقدر زیبان انقدر انسانی هن در برابر واقعا وضعیت اسفناک پناهجویان نه ما در این مورد بیشتر صحبت میکنیم مسابقه این هفتمون با عمر مکرم از بنیان گذار بنیان گذار سازمان مسلمانان سابق در سوئد با ما باش بهروز بوچانی یک پناهنده ایرانی که الان 6 ساله در جزیره منوس به سر میبره اخیرا بالاترین جایزه ادبی استرالیا رو برد و واقعا وقتی نگاه میکنی به شرایط غیر انسانی که توی جزیره منوس وجود داره و رفتار این شخص واقعا انسانیتش پاسخش به این شرایط واقعا هم آدم واقعا دیپرس میکنه وقتی شرط رو میبینه ولی از اون بر آدم امیدوار میکنه که چقدر انسانیت دقیقا. هنوز قویه و این به روز بچانی یه دریچه ای رو باز کرده که بتونه تمام مردم دنیا بتونن خودشون رو در این بیان ابراز بکنن و این خیلی مهمه و در واقع نورفکن رو میدازه تو به وضعیت پناهنده ها و کسایی که متقاضی سرپناه هستن که افتادن فرار میکنن شرایط متوابه تو دنیا در این حال یک تصویر نشون میده چطوری بنیان سیاست های پناهد پذیری استرالیا و خیلی کشورها کاملا زد انسانی ها اینو نشون میده شما استرالیا اینا رو گذاشته اینجا هیچ پایان نداره قرار نیست به بررسی بکنن وضعیتشون قرار اینجا تا آخر امروشون باشن بدون هیچ امکاناتی و بدون هیچ آینده و انسانیتش ازشون در واقع دوزیدن این کار کردن و خب میدونیم که توی استرالیا کمپین های زیادی هست از کسایی که دارن تلاش میکنن که این افراد رو بیارن به خاک استرالیا ولی خب واقعا به قول شما یه دریچه یه و این فقط استرالیا نیست الان ما میدونیم که بعد از دوره جنگ سرد که دولت های غربی میخواستن چهره انسانی تری از خودشون نمایان کنن بعد از اون دیدیم که الان واقعیت و واقعیت کریهشون خیلی مشخصه که اصلا براشون حق انسان اهمیت نداره و به همین خاطره نه فقط استرالیا بلکه خیلی کشور الان بازداشت میکنن دیپورت میکنن تو خود میدونین برای کسایی که دارن سعی میکنن وارد مرز اروپا بشن از هر 18 نفر که وارد میشن یه نفر میمیره یعنی فکر کن تعداد چقدر وسیعی داره توی خود دریاها غرق میشه و اتفاقا میای کمکشون هم بکنی یه جرم الان محسوب میشه مثل استنسد 15 که الان دادگاهی شده بودن دادگاهی که بخاطر میخواستن جلوی دیپورت و برگردونن یه سری پناهنده ها رو به نایجریا و گانا فکر کنم بگیرن و اینا رو دستگیر کردن و میخواستن تحت قوانین علیه تروریسم اینا رو محاکمه بکنن و حکمش میتونست تا آخر عمر توی زندان باشه یعنی حبس ابد باشه و وقتی نگاه میکنی که چطوری کسایی که دارن از حقوق انسان و اینکه جلو کشته شدن انسان ها رو دارن میگیرن دولت انگلیس میتونه این کار رو بگیره بکنه و اینا رو تحت قوانین زد تروریستی بگیره به محاکم بشه واقعا شرمواره و این کشوریه که نخست وزیرش که امروز سر کاره ترزامه 16 تا فکر کنم 16 تا بررسی رو که خود دولت انجام دادن تحقیق کردن و گفتن که در واقع پناهنده ها و مهاجرا به مملکت هیچ نسل منفی ندارن توی کنفرانس هاشون میگن میگه کسایی که یه اه 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 کسایی که ناراحت از پناهنده اینجا میان حقوقشون بارن میارن حق دارن این کار بکنن از آدم باور نمیکنه که چطوری میتونه توی روز روشن یه سیاست زده انسانی رو تبلیغ بکنن ربطی به واقعیت نداره یه سیاست رو اینا تبلیغ بکنن و اعمال میکنن و دقیقا هم چیزی که هست به هم جنایی شده اگر بخوای پناهنده رو کمک کنی و وقتی که فکر میکنی مثلا دوره نازی ها آدمایی بودن که کمک کردن یهودی ها فرار کنن عملا الان اینطوریه ده. اون آدما اعدام می شدن یا زندانی می شدن الان هم اینطوریه که برای مثال خیلی الان که میرن کمک کنن اینو مثلا میبرنشون دادگاهیشون میکنن میخوان زندانیشون کنن که جلو اینو بگیرن بعد از اون برم 
خود عمل پناهندگی رو غیر قانونی محسوب کردن میدونی مثلا میگن که این آدم ها غیر قانونی هن. ولی واقعیتش اینه که همیشه پناهندگی یه چیزی بوده که آدما بدون اجازه بالاخره با اجبار مجبور شدن فرار کنن اینجوری نیست که ویزا دارن و پاسپورتشون همه درسته دارن فرار میکنن اصلا پناهندگی الان به شکل فقط تو به شکل غیر قانونی میتونی پناهندگی بگیری بعد میان اعلام میکنن میگن اینا غیر قانونی وارد مملکت شدن به این خاطر باید حق دارن که این بعد ازشون بیاد اصلا آدم تعجب میکنه که چوت دنیایی دارین زندگی میکنین تازه اونا هم که میان تو کبی کشور کشور میرسن و پرونده پناهندگیشون تحت بررسی قرار میگیره شما میتونید ببینین که از جلو کار تا زمانی که دارن برنامه بررسی میکنن جلو کارشون گرفته میشه این تو اروپا هم اینطوری ها تو نه, فقط، نه فقط توی مثلا ترکیه و عراق و اینجور جا همین هفته گذشته یکی از با ما تماس که آقای فساحت و خانواده‌اش که برده بودن توی شهر سویندان اینا رو نگه داشته بودن توی سرترین درجه جای نگه داشتن که با دو تا بچه کوچولو چهار ساله و دوازده ساله سیستم گرمایی و آب نداره که زمانی که درجه دما توی انگلیس منهای دو درجه بود و هرچی شما زنگ میزنیم به محصولین اینجا و دولت مستقمن میگم که حالا تو مثلا سه چهار روز دیگه میایم نگاه میکنیم ببین چجوریه یعنی باور نمیکنه آدم که میتونه حتی اونایی که پاشون رسیده به یه مملکتی چطوری به شکل غیر انسانی یعنی که شهروند در جام حساب نمیشن اتفاقا و این این واقعا نشون میده که دولت هایی که امروز کاملا دارن مسئله پناهندگیش کاملا براش مهم نیست به یک سیاست ضد انسانی تبدیلش کردن و بر علیه مردم و برای جداسازی و نفاق و تفرقه پراکندگی بین مردم کاملا آگاهانه دارن از این استفاده کردن و خب این ستنسد پونزده یعنی این پونزده نفری که اومدن سر کردن جلوی دیپورت چند تا پناهنده آفریقایی رو بگیرن توی فرگای ستنسد اینا خب همونطوری که صحبت کردیم داشتن دادگاهی می شدن چیزی که گفتن خب الان دادگاه گفته که آزادن ولی خب یعنی حکم زندان, حکم زندان, زندان بهشون ندادن ولی هنوز اینا رو محکوم, محکوم کردن و خب این چیزی که اینا گفتن اینه که خب اولا فرجام خواهند داد به خاطر اینکه این ناعادلانه است اینا کاری نکردن صلح آمیز رفتن سر کردن جلوی کشته شدن چند پناهنده رو بگیرن ولی چیزی که گفتن اینه که اتفاقی که به ما افتاده هیچی نیست در مقابل اتفاقی که هر ثانیه داره به پناهندگان اتفاق میفته یعنی میرن وسط شب پناهنده رو میگیرن که دیپورتش کنن بهش حق و حقوق نمیدن میزننش بازداشتش میکنن هیچ نوع حق و حقوقی بهش قائل نیستن میگن که خب اتفاقا ما شرطمون خیلی بهتره از این پناهنده و این یه واقعیته شما هر جای دست میذارین این قضیه پناهندگان واقعا توی صورت آدم نمیتونی ازش فرار کنی شما ترکیه رو نگاه کن ترکیه تعداد پناهندگان ایرانی که توی ترکیه هستن با یه وضع رو بر هستن که یونا سازمان ملل اصلا قضیه پناهندگی رو عملا تعویض دولت ترکیه داده و دولت ترکیه هم همه میدونن که دولتیه که دستش رو دست داعشه از یه طرف دستش با جمهوری اسلامی همکاری میکنه تمام مسئولین دولتی دولت ترکیه الان همه از این مسلمان ها هستن که تو بگی من زده آدم بی خدایی هستم از حکومت اسلامی و مذهبی ایرانی در رفتم یا از برای حقوق زنان دفاع کردن یا اینکه نمیخواست میخوام جوانی هستم یا میخوام زندگی غیر مذهبی داشته باشم شما کاملا محکومی تو این شرایط و سازمان هیچ مسئله در مورد این قرار نمیگیره چند تا از اون کیس های هست پناهنده ایرانی که میشناسیم و مستقیما در تماس هستن با با ما و این وضعیت هم نگاه کنیم ببینید چی کار میشه در مورد کسانی مثل ارسلان نجاتی، ایمان سلیمانی امیری، امیر و مینا کلته یعنی اینا افرادی هستند که واقعا مثلا بی خودان و خب رد شدن از طریق سازمان ملل یا سالها ترکیان و الان دولت اینا رو داده به دولت ترکیه و یعنی بهشون گفته که خب دیگه قرار نیست اعزام بشین و به یکی از پناهندهایی که بی خداست و خوب میشناسیمش ارسلان نجاتی سازمان ملل گفته که هیچ کشور سالسی شما رو قبول نمیکنه به خاطر شرایطتون یعنی چی به خاطر اینکه بی خداست قبولش نمیکنه یعنی چی یعنی الان انگیزاسیون هست قبل از اینکه یکی میتونه تقاضای یه جای امنی برسه یعنی واقعا شرایط اسفناکه و خب باید مبارزه کرد علیه این وضعیت بعد دفاع کرد از حق و حقوق آدما شرفند باشن شرفند نباشن قانونی اینجا باشه باشن نباشن 
حق دارن که یه زندگی انسانی تری داشته باشن دقیقا شما در, مر... در... در برابر این کمپایی رو که دارم میسازن توی جزیره مانوس در مقابلش آقای بهروز بوچانی بولن میشه و دنیا اعتراض میکنه شما میبینین در رابطه با پناهنده ای که توی سویندان هست میان کمپین های مختلف میان کسایی که اومدن کمک کردن کشته بودن که هواداری پناهنده ها بودن کسایی که از اون شهر بودن حتی به بخش جنرال چپ بعضی از نماینده ها اومدن سعی کردن کمک بکنن تو اونجا شما هر لحظه ای که وجود داره در مقابل تمام این بدالتی سر میبینین به خاطر اون نیاز انسانی کمپین به وجود میاد و آدمایی هستن که دست به کار میتونن به خاطر که نمیتونه جامعه و مردم نمیتونن قبول کنن که با انسان اینطوری برخورد بشه یعنی نرم طبیعی جامعه حاکم امروز برخورد غیر انسانی با پناه و پناهنده یکی از اون در واقع لحظه که جوامع و سیستم داره خودش رو کاملا نشون میده و از اون طرف هم جامعه انسانی داره خودش رو در مقابل این نشون میده به نظرم بهترین کاری که میتونیم بکنیم برای انتهای این, این بخش از برنامه اینه که سخنان خود بهروز پوچانی رو بشنمیم واقعا نمیدونم چه, چه احساسی دارم وقتی صداش رو میشنمم وقتی انسانیتش رو میبینم واقعا امیدوار میشم به زندگی و امیدوارم که بتونیم دست در دست هم یه تأثیر مثبتی داشته باشیم روی زندگی پناهجویان سراسر دنیا و و در زم و به خصوص پناهنده ایرانی که الان در خیلی کشور از ترکیه و عراق و یونان و مانوس و غیره مالزی اندونزی واقعا حق و حقوقشون داره ازشون گرفته میشه When I arrived at Christmas Island six years ago, an immigration official called me into the office and told me that they were going to exile me to Manus Island, a place in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. I told them that I am a writer. That same person just laughed at me and ordered the guards to exile me to Manus. I kept this image in my mind for years, even while I was writing my novel. And even right now, as I am writing this acceptance speech, it was an act of humiliation. When I arrived in Manus, I created another image for myself. I imagined a novelist in a remote prison. Sometimes I would walk half naked beside the prison fences and imagine a novelist locked up right there in that place. This image was all inspiring. For years I maintained this image in my mind even while I was forced to wait in a long queues to get food or while enjoying other humiliating moments. This image always helped me uphold my dignity and keep my identity as a human being. In fact, I created this image in opposition to the image created by the system. After years of struggling against a system that has completely ignored our individual identities I am happy that we have arrived at this moment this proves that words still have the power to challenge in human systems and structures I have always say that I believe in words and literature I believe that literature has the potential to make change and challenge structures of power Literature has the power to give us freedom. Yes, it is true. I have been in a cage for years, but throughout this time, my mind has always been producing words. And these words have taken me across borders, taken me overseas and to unknown places. I truly believe words are more powerful than the fences of this place this prison this is not just a basic slogan I am not an idealist I am not expressing the views of an idealist here 
these words are from a person who has been held captive on this island for almost six years. A person who has witnessed an extraordinary tragedy unfold in this place. These words allow me to appear there with you tonight. With humility, I would like to say that this award is a victory. It is a victory not only for us, but for literature and art. And above all, it is a victory for humanity, a victory for human being, human dignity. A victory against a system that has never recognized us as human being. It is a victory against a system that has reduced us to numbers. This is a beautiful moment. Let us all rejoice tonight in the power of literature. you on our program. I wanted to speak to you about the whole idea of asylum and apostasy, especially after Rahaf's case. And you yourself applied for asylum here in Sweden yes. um, as an atheist mm. who had fled Egypt. Mm. Uh, you came across a lot of problems though, and that's something I think um, others do too. Yes. What was the main problem with you not being accepted initially? Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you for having me on, on your show uh, and yes you are uh, it, it is a big problem here with ex-muslims seeking asylum in Sweden uh, because of the let's say the burden of proof I think it's the migration agency exaggerates in, in placing uh, demands on on let's say proving that a person has left Islam I think yeah unreasonable demands. So, for example, in my case, uh, when I came here and applied for asylum and I, and I thought that I would just like tell them everything about my story and what I'm facing and so on, and they will just, no, uh, provide me with asylum. But uh, it's, my experience with the migration agency is that they were not really trying to to evaluate the evidence that I gave them to ascertain whether I have a valid uh, valid grounds for asylum, but they were more trying to find excuses to reject my asylum. Um, so, for example, I remember, like uh, when I showed them like stuff from social media and stuff, they said, "Oh, but maybe that's photoshopped." And I was like, "But you can check that online." Um, so, some ridiculous stuff like that. And in the end, they did acknowledge that. Uh, for example, people in Egypt who leave Islam or are critical of Islam are being persecuted, but they refuse to acknowledge that I was one, like I had left Islam. Um, and they had said that it, had I been able to prove that, I would have been entitled to asylum. Uh, and another thing is that they said that I did not provide them with evidence that the Egyptian authorities are aware of my views on Islam. Um, which is something that I cannot really do. I cannot ask the Egyptian embassy for a document saying that, oh yeah, we know that this guy is an atheist, and he's a pain in the ass. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and of course, this is something we see quite regularly, don't we? Yes. Uh, people being refused uh, yes. based on the fact that they're not believed and also yes. uh, asking for evidence that's just really impossible to get. I mean, unless you can bring your dead corpse and say, well, does this yes. prove, is this proof enough that I've I'm going to be persecuted yes, after it's, the fact, you know. Yes, yeah, like catch twenty two thing. Yeah. So it's like maybe you need to be in prison for you to get asylum, but if you are in prison you can't get asylum. <laughs> but well, of course it's it's uh, it's reasonable to some extent for people to prove that they have like to that their beliefs are genuine and they have like they have a, a genuine case at, uh, and to talk about how they they came to leave Islam and what they think about it and so on, um, but within reason, um, and and this is something I would say that 
the migration board does not do for the most part. Although it's also like sometimes also it's it can be a bit like a lottery because there have been cases of ex-Muslims uh, who have been granted asylum rather, yeah, without too much of a fuss. Um, so, and it's something also the migration agency has, has been criticized for, uh, that it, it, there's like some kind of sort of like non-conformity. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, what about, there's a case uh, you're, you're uh, working on of an Iraqi atheist. Yes. He's also facing deportation, isn't he? Yes, exactly. So Ahmad al Qomar is his name, and he's uh, from Iraq, as you said, uh, an ex-Muslim atheist, um, and he has been here in Sweden, struggling for us for his asylum for three years now, uh, and he's actually uh, facing threats even from his father and his uncle, and he even provided the migration agency with a copy of like. Not even the copy, the original of uh, of an arrest warrant uh, that is that is uh, yeah against him in Iraq uh, with like a like a, a sentence from the court uh, related to uh, his his atheism, um, him being vocal about his atheism, uh, but still he was he was rejected by the migration agency time and again. Um, because of the same thing, the, they are saying that he has not proved to them that he has left Islam. Mm, so even an arrest warrant isn't enough for them? No, they, <coughs> but that's the thing, like, in my experience and, and in other cases I've seen, in some of the other cases I've seen at least, it seems to me, like from my point of view, it's like this, you provide migration board, uh, the migration board with a, with a case, what they do is they look into it and try to find, okay, here, how will we reject this? What can we say about this and that so that we reject it? This is, it seems to me, their approach. This is their angle, in a way. Um, and I think it's supposed to be the other way around. Um, oh? Yeah, definitely. Mm. And it's interesting because now you finally have asylum after a big fight and a battle like Rahav. I mean, yes. I if you don't fight for it, it's very likely that you uh, will be uh, fall within the cracks. Yes. And uh, you are now working uh, against honor crimes. Uh, yes. In, uh, in, in Stockholm. I, I mean, a, a lot of great work that you're doing because you're now able to. Yes, exactly. And it's like I had to go a little bit to to the ex to an extreme, as you know, like because after they they rejected uh, my case, I was thinking I was going to get deported, and I was thinking, okay, what can I do to prove to the migration board that I'm no longer a Muslim? Um, and then I made a video and talked about my views and talked about my case, talked about the situation of ex-Muslims in Muslim majority countries. Um, about the situation in Egypt, uh, or like with people who criticize Islam and, and so on. Um, and then I, I said that the only thing that no Muslim would ever do is to desecrate the Quran. And this is what I did on video. Uh, so I desecrated a copy of the Quran on video. Uh, and then first I, I showed this to, my, to some of my friends here who are aware of my case. They just freaked out and they said, okay, maybe you'll get the asylum, but we don't know if you will live long enough to enjoy it, even here in Sweden. I was like, yeah, but will this increase my chances? Um, they said, yeah, but maybe send it to migration board first privately um, before going public with it. Then I did that and uh, I sent it to migration board and the same email to the Egyptian embassy, the Egyptian foreign ministry and the Egyptian interior ministry so that they have, okay, here is your proof that they are aware of it. So, in a, in a sense, they push you to extremes in order to be yeah. able to prove who you are. You know, yes, it's, that it's is your personal belief. I yes, think. this is sometimes the case. Yes, yes, uh, often the case. Actually, I would say. Uh, um, why? I mean, why do you think it's so important for ex-Muslims to have asylum and protection in a place like Sweden or Europe or anywhere? Um, I think, like. In, in most of like Muslim majority countries, there is a very hostile climate uh, towards ex-Muslims 
and people who criticize Islam and atheists, um, both socially and legally. Uh, so most countries are not safe for ex-Muslims to be open with their identity, to be open with their beliefs or lack of beliefs, or to exercise their freedom of conscience and freedom of, of uh, thought, uh, freedom of belief. Um, and this is why it's, it's very important uh, for them to be able to get this protection, to be able to be fully free and safe. But what do you say to, uh, you know, the Home Office, for example, has told some of our activists that they could go back and live in Pakistan or Egypt or Iran and just not mention that they're ex-Muslims and just uh, live discreetly, basically? Yes, actually, this, at some point, this was something that was said to me as well. Like, I remember, like, Migration Board said something, uh, like, in the, we had, like, a court session and, uh, and they said something um, that maybe we, when we return him back, to Egypt, he will hide or change his views. I was like, but what kind of argument is that? Uh, so this is an argument that they use sometimes. Um, the thing is, there's a, like two two aspects how Migration Board uh, evaluates uh, like the asylum when it comes to ex-Muslims. One aspect is that they are uh, this like their beliefs are genuine. And another aspect is that they would be perceived as such. They would be perceived as an atheist by other people and hence this would put them in danger. And so if this other aspect is lacking, uh, they don't see that there is a threat. So no need for asylum in that case. Um, yeah. So... But being silent... Uh, the, there is not like you can say this about anything. Then you can say this all like about being like don't any religion. Like, don't yeah, don't yeah, exactly. Yeah, and then nothing will happen. Yeah, nothing will happen to you. Uh, they would never say that no, in that situation. No, yeah. no. Um, yeah. Hmm. Um, I guess I wanted to uh, talk to you about um, why. Why did you become an ex-Muslim? Because that would be interesting to know. Because yeah. everybody has different stories, don't they? Yeah, yeah. I would say in my case, actually, it was my father who inadvertently made me an atheist. I know. Right? <laughs> I think the, like there were many factors at play. Like, like my parents sent me to like private schools where everything was taught in English. So I started learning English when I was four, and you kind of get into like almost some kind of subculture. So I was like reading mostly things that were produced outside of my own culture, like the movies, you get it. We have this saying in Egypt, like in many Muslim majority countries, they say the Western culture will corrupt the youth. There is some truth to that, <laughs> but it's not exactly corruption from my point of view. Uh, but it's like kind of broadens your horizons a little bit and like makes you think that there are other ways out there and makes you think like, okay, but why, why should I hate like gay people or why do I think that uh, men are superior to women and uh, and so on? But, and maybe like other values that have to do like with human rights and equality and so on, they seem better. <laughs> uh, and then there was this conflict for a while. And another thing that my father encouraged me to, to read a lot. So I was reading a lot since I was, yeah, yeah my, I was a weird child, like spending a lot of time reading. Uh, and I think this kind of like developed some kind of like critical thinking, um, not taking just whatever people tell me for, for granted without thinking about it. Um, and at some point, because most Muslims, they take religion out of inheritance, not out of conviction. Uh, and then if you, when I started to think, okay, I was like, okay, I want to, to study the scripture and be really convinced of it myself, like uh, reach my own conviction. And the funny thing is that I actually approached it from an angle that I wanted to confirm my faith in a way. Uh, and the more I studied the scripture, the more I was like, okay, it's not very nice. This is, doesn't make much sense. This is so at some point I, uh, I decided because there was like so many like contradictions in the Hadith and the contradictions between the Hadith and the Quran and so on. So I decided at some point to totally reject the Hadith and I became a Quranist. Uh, so relying only on the Quran 
uh, for a while. Then I started to study the Quran a bit more and the history of Islam and uh, like, I was like, okay, <laughs> this is uh, unsalv. No, I cannot salvage this. I cannot do anything. So and uh, so I would say I rejected it on on two fronts, both like rationally and ethically. So there is there was like too many things that uh, didn't like didn't sit well with me ethically like when it comes to like women's rights when it comes to gay rights and so on it was just like it's very difficult to reconcile the scripture with that uh, so this was one thing the other thing i found the idea of this like all powerful god who could have created human beings in whatever form he wants and he's like omniscient all seeing and he knows the the future and but he still creates human beings weak in order to sin and then, even though he knew that beforehand, he still gets angry when they sin. And even though it's the way he created them, and even though he's all loving and this like omnibenevolent God, he sends them to burn hell in, for eternity because of the way he created them. Even though he knew all this would happen, this just didn't like didn't compute for me. So at some point, I was like, okay. What about um, your your family and friends and that you had when you were yeah. Muslim? How how is that? Yeah, there has been friction uh, at some point, but they actually they knew about my views only after I had left. Uh, so that there would have been more friction then. But um, yeah, like I remember when, when the when same-sex marriage was legalized in the U.S. For some reason, it got really big in the in Egypt, and the people were pretty angry about it. And I had like my cousins on Facebook and uh, yeah, relatives and so on posting things like uh, how can they allow that and what's next they were allow legalized pedophilia and like things like that I was like okay and then there was this um, maybe you remember that one there was uh, like a picture that the Atheist Republic made with the Kaaba with the rainbow painted on it so I posted that on Facebook and whoa it's like things went berserk shit hit the roof like uh, my relatives were cursing me on Facebook and blocking me and uh, my mother like basically even though she's not on Facebook but somebody went and told her and like she had like almost a nervous breakdown and like yeah so the, it was a it was a lot of mess and this happened to be coincidentally the same day that I got my first rejection from migration board well, it was not a great day that one <laughs> yeah so. I guess as a final question I would say do you have any regrets about leaving Islam and whether you had to leave your country, you had problems with your family? No, I would not say so because right now I, I would say that I live with full integrity uh, and I live according to the convictions that I really have and I'm, and I'm free and this is even though like you know we are not we're never really totally safe, so to speak. But for me, I care m much more about my freedom than my safety. So, no, no, no regrets at all. Thank you, Omar. Thank you. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to our year's anniversary. And yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us 
immoral and corrupt. And that's why the, you need to support us. We are and the alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa. Of corruption and immorality. So do support us. Here's a short video from Patreon that explains how you can help us with even just $1 a week. That's nothing. Support us. Patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators. It's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or webcomics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream. And in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.